Michamocha. General idea, Michamocha, we're trying to figure out what does it mean that no one's like you, God? And we're saying no one's like you, God, because there's no existence except for God. There's no existence except for God while well, we have a world. Then we have to go into the whole thing about how was the world created? How did it come about? The bottom line that we got to is that God did not create the world in partnership with anybody. He doesn't run the world in partnership with anybody. There's no other power or anything going on. There's God. Everything is a creation of his. And all of creation came something from nothing. Only he can do that. Only he can make something from nothing happen. Even if you want to take the greatest of spiritual heights and go all the way down, you don't get a physical world. You still just get a spiritual world. So the spiritual God created and the God created the physical. And oh, there's such a great difference between the physical and the spiritual. Doesn't matter. Everything is a creation of God and nothing shares God's power of the world, of ruling and creation, etc. Then we went into great detail, going through everybody's spirit animals. What does the evolution kind of look like? Because the higher up you're going to get, the less branches is going to be. So imagine you have the spring, the original spring of water, and the spring of water is flowing forth. The farther off it goes, the sudden you're getting more tributaries are coming out of it and more rivers and streams and whatever. But if you would follow everything back to the source, it's all coming from a single spring. In a general idea, that's kind of how creation works as well. Everything's coming from God and then God creates a system for creation to come about. The lower down, the farther out you go on the system, the more manifestations those original building blocks can take. So you have the 10 spheres, the 10 attributes, the dynamics of it work, etc. But just in a broad idea, you have those 10 building blocks, the three intellectual faculties, the seven emotive faculties. And from there, they start branching off, branching off, branching off. The more you go, the more creation comes from it, basically. Eventually, you get to manifold creation that we have now. I don't even know if that's correctly used. You have the numerous, the myriad aspects of creation that we have now, which means that if you could go backwards and you want to go up, the higher up you go, the channel's going to narrow. So eventually, all these things that have certain similar attributes and characteristics are all going to come back to a single same source. For an example, chesed, kindness, kindness is the broad category. As it comes down and starts manifesting down in this world, there's different angels that fall into the kindness category, there's different spiritual beings, etc. Then eventually you have the different souls, different aspects within creation, within the physical world, even before this world. But by the time it hits the physical world, there's so many different ways of kindness manifesting. So if you trace it all back, eventually you'd come back to the parent category of, of kindness, which obviously eventually goes back up to God. So same thing is with Gavura, with strength or severity. You start off with the parent category and as it's coming down, it's going to start manifesting in different ways. Let's look at the rooster thing backwards. Instead of taking the rooster and going up with it, you're starting at the top down and you're going down with it. They have the attribute of severity and the way it looks like in the highest worlds. As it comes down, all of a sudden it's manifesting now as an angel. Angel, which is Gabriel. As it's coming down lower now, it's going to start manifesting in other ways. Eventually, you can get a rooster. So, for example, we know from the patriarchs, Yitzchak, Isaac, represents Gevura. It's a massive range. So many things can fall into this general category. All these descriptions that we're going through, and even now, we got into the whole thing with the chariot, to see there's the spiritual entities, there's the higher entities. This is what like up here. It pinpoints all these different traits and attributes, and then it shows you how manifests down in this world. But the chariot, the animals are rising up and going back again. There's a flux that occurred. In the spiritual realms, this flux, it's creating a certain kind of rhythm. And that rhythm, because it exists in the higher worlds, it does exist also as well in the lower world. What does that rhythm look like? So it looks like a heartbeat. It looks like the inhale and exhalation of breath because it's flux. It's that up and down and the up and down. So we see it's not manifesting in the physical world in all these different ways. Things aren't just, like we're not just here. It's not just us that we're not just here, but every aspect and detail of creation isn't just here either. It's all coming from something. That's why they talk about da ma la ma Know what is above you. Know that everything that happens above is because of you. So our actions ripple on up and whatever's going on in the spiritual realms ripples on down. That's the example that they give. The sun moves thousands of miles, but down here on earth, the shading moves slightly. We can't even comprehend in the higher realms, the massive shifts, because down here on earth, it seems like something so small. An airplane, if you look at an airplane, are you ever gonna get to where you're going? But really it's traveling at great distance very quickly. That's why even when we say, could do stuff down here that could have such a great effect up there, that's why. Because you have to look at the directions that you're going in and the way that it's down here is thousands of miles metaphorically up there. And thousands of miles, so much that's going up there can manifest with even just like a single step down here. The whole general category of all this is what's being described in the Mimer about the way the world works. Basically, the world does exist or it doesn't exist. Well, it kind of exists. It exists dependent upon God. But it seems like there's so much going on in the world. How can you say it doesn't exist? Well, that's why we have to explain how everything's working. Realize that everything is all coming from the same place, ultimately. So that's how we did all the stuff with the leaves and the grass and the foliage. We did all the stuff with the rooster. We did the snow, which described the way this, the process works because it has to keep tenthing. The light has to keep tenthing and tenthing and tenthing. Then we got to light. Hashem wrapping himself in the talus. The whole thing about Simpson, we know the contractions that occur. Okay, then we did the, the chariot of Ezekiel, Yechezkel's chariot, which is the sources of Yitzira. So the next world up of where all these things come from. And then we got to the lion. So it described now the process of the lion, how the lion came about. We have this general idea also that down here we have a physical line. If you start going 
up, as we already saw with the idea of the chariot, a lion, like other animals, it's a red flesh beast animal. And it's something that comes from severity and strength. A lion roars, that's not considered kindness. Because when a lion roars, you feel it dead in your heart. Don't ever turn your back to a predator or else they think that you're praying, you're running from them. That's the general idea of it, that it all goes back. We can even see certain signs down here in this world of like, oh, it's a red flesh beast. Down here, we already know this is a sign of something that comes from ultimately from Gavura. So we're looking now at the lion. We see as it goes up in the higher worlds, there's different angels, angels that are described as fiery beings. So the lion down here is a physical line. Once you make the leap up to the spiritual realms, all of a sudden you look at fiery angels. Okay, in general, angels are fiery beings. Eventually we get all the way up to angels of the upper realms, the Khan Gavriel, etc. Till ultimately, when we get up to the building block, point we could trace back up to Chesed and Gvur. Now the lion, the word for a lion is Arye. It's the same letters as Ria, which is sight. We're finding parallels in things because we recognize it's a signal that in the spiritual source they're coming from the same place. That's like the Hanukkah mimer that we did that we said what's the connection between Hanukkah and Sukkot? Oh they're both eight day holidays. They have a similarity and because they have a similarity they come down into this world and they manifest as eight day holidays. It works that way and the whole idea of it is lessening the darkness. They both have that attribute of not just lessening the darkness but lessening the opposition to godliness and eventually turning it over so that what was once opposition is now light also. That's what Hanukkah and Sukkot in short, that's what they have in common. So we see that. So the same idea is what we're doing now with line. We see this. Now we're seeing something else has a similarity. Something else has a similarity. That means they're all coming from the same source up here. And just as they manifest, the light keeps coming down to the world. They start becoming separate things. But we identify and call separate things. But up there, it's all connected because they're all coming from the same source. The main, the parent category is the same for all of them. So what is that? We have Arye, which is a lion. It has the same letters as Ria, which means sight. What's compared to sight is Chachma. Wisdom is compared to sight. The more you see, you're like, oh, I see it now. You don't necessarily mean that your eyes open. You mean I understand it now. We use these terms all the time. We don't even realize. So we have all these different examples. Who is someone who's wise? Someone who could see the consequences of their behavior. Someone who could see the future as an outcome of things. So we see sight and wisdom are, are related to each other. We had multiple examples of that. That a fool goes in darkness. Why is he considered a fool? Because he doesn't know. If you have light, then you're not a fool anymore. Now you're wise. It's the same thing spiritually. You can't see in the spiritual realms if you don't have intellect. As in if you're not using your intellect. If you're not expanding your intellect. Ignorance is bliss. It's a blissful existence, but it's a small existence. Yeah, how do you have light and you see and etc. wisdom? If you don't know what to do, you go to someone who's wise. It's all very straightforward. This is all stuff that we know. Usually if you want advice from someone, you don't go to someone who doesn't know. You go to someone who knows stuff. Anyways, so we see there's a connection between all these, between Chachma and Ria and Arya and Lion. So Lion, Sight and, and Wisdom, they're connected to each other. Then we went into the general idea of, we're describing Chachma more, Wisdom is the starting point for everything. As the life force comes through, Chachma is the first attribute that then goes to start creating the other attribute. It's a parent attribute, Chachma. It's considered something that gives life to everything because of that. It's considered a starting point of creation because there's the godly light. You can't just create like that. You have to make the process go into place. Now we can start. So Chachma is the point of like, okay, Okay, now we can start. Etc. 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 More about the lion. We have the lion is also connected to Anochi. Anochi, which means I. If you recognize the word of Anochi, Anochi is the first word of the Ten Commandments. Anochi Hashem Alkecha Sheretzicha Meretzayim Bezavadim. I'm Lord your God. He took you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Most Rabb, I think it, we have commentary tells us over Acher Anochi Hashem Alkecha. I'm Lord your God. Hadu Dechtiv Arye Shag Mila Yira. It's from Amos, who's one of the prophets. It says Arye Shag Mila Yira. I split it because it's Hashem's name. I want you to see it's two different names of God that's being used. The name of Adai Hashem. Hashem Diber Milo Yunave. A lion has roared who will not fear. The Lord God has spoken who will not prophesy. What are we saying here? It's talking about when Hashem said the word Anochi, I, at the time of the giving of the Torah, commentary is telling us it's comparing it to the roar of a lion. That's what it's comparing this Anochi to. That everybody trembles from it. And we even see that. The Torah tells us, It was on the third day, when it was morning, that there were thunderclaps and lightning flashes, and the thick cloud was upon the mountain, a very powerful blast of a shofar, and the time Entire nation that was in the camp shuddered, trembled. And we're finding the parallels now. When God came down the mountain, said God spoke, everybody trembled. What's something that you can have this reverberation deep inside you that makes you that makes you tremble, make you shudder? Wait a second, a lion's roar is like that. Drawing the parallels, bring this all together. When Hashem said Anochi, this is a profound level of revelation that's compared to a lion's roar. It's talking about a profound level of revelation that's similar to a lion's roar. Why? Because you tremble from it. When Hashem speaks, who does not prophesy? So when Hashem speaks, who does not prophesy? Who does not experience this tremendous revelation? When Hashem says Anochi. God says Anochi. He came down the mountain. There was a tremendous revelation that occurred. Comparable, greater, broader terms to a lion's roar. Why do I bring this in? Anochi is actually not a Hebrew word. How do you say I in Hebrew? Ani. They say actually Anochi might be an Egyptian version of I. But if you look at it, what's Anochi? Anochi is Ani plus the letter Chaf. 
Kaf stands for Keter, which is the highest level. Remember the crown? The crown goes on top of the head. What is Keter? Keter is that mediator. It's between the essence of the emanator and the emanations. It's the source of the 10th sphere of Atzil, so it's considered the most hidden of all. If you remember visually, Chachma is the first. It's the starting point of all creation because that's where actual creation comes about. But above it is Keter is above it. And what's above Keter is the emanator, God. This part of God that's so beyond the world. But then there's the aspect of God that this is the part, the aspect that's now going to allow creation to come about. That's where the whole process comes in here. Keter, that is the connecting pipe. Well, the mediator. We're going even higher with this lion's roar situation. This is also a pasuk from the Torah, describing by the giving of the Torah, They said to Moshe, you speak with us, and we will hear, but let God not speak with us lest we die. I should have read it with this other verse over here, the other versifications we got going on here. Commentary talks about that. The people wanted to hear directly from God. But no, we want the Torah directly from God. But God comes down and he says the first of the Ten Commandments, and everybody just, the gone. Okay, revive and bring it back. God says the next one, okay, gone. And the people are like, we should probably think of a new system. How about, Moshe, you relate to us what the rest of the commandments are. Here, we can see even just from the text in general that all of a sudden, everything's coming to place right now. The people are trembling from it. Wow, this is serious stuff here. We're afraid. Fear. Gevura. It's all attached to it. Because again, the lion roars and who's going to not fear from it? The Lord speaks who does not prophecy from it is in like great levels of revelation that cause the people to tremble and fear. Now, all this apparently somehow, by the way, this is three times Yad. Yad is head. The Yad all explained, talking about hands of strength. We have a whole math equation here, which I'm going to show you, and then we're going to break it down, and we'll come back to see how the math equation works. So the word yad in Hebrew, right, which we know means hand, yad, yud is 10, dalit is 4, gematria. We actually did this before. You know a yad is 14 because you have 14 joints on the hand. Each finger is 3 and your thumb is 2, so it gets to 14. We're going to get to the 14 in a minute, but there's your fun fact about 14 joints. Okay, 3 times hand. So we have 3 descriptions of hand. These are hands of strength. Yad ha the great hand, which you'll see the verses where it comes in. Yad ha-chazaka, the strong hand. Chazak, strong. Yad rama, lifted up raised hand, exalted kind of terms. These are the three yad that we're saying, oh, this is all like this. Now, we have this whole math equation that we're going to get to. We're going to see more. I'll just tell you what it is, but we're going to see more about how the breakdown works. So this says yud, hey, vav, and then another hey. This happens with all the Hebrew letters, especially when you're doing the Gematria stuff. You can do the math according to the letters, like Yud and Dalit. Yud is 10, Dalit is 4, so you get 14. Or you can actually spell out the letters, and that gets you more numbers, basically. Yud, how do you write out a Yud? Like, how do you spell the letter A? Spell the letter B or C. So Yud, how do you spell the letter Yud? Yud Vav Dalit, that reads Yud. You use a Yud to spell Yud. And Hey, how do you spell Hey? Well, there's different ways that you can spell Hey. It depends on which Gematria you're working with. Hey could be spelled with a Hey and a Yud. Hey, you can spell it with an Aleph. That works also, hey. And each one is going to get you a different number. Then vav, how do you spell out the letter vav? Vav, yud, vav. And then hey again. Hey with a yud, hey with an aleph, etc. So according to which spelling, there's different, like milo, it's, it's, it's with aleph and yud. Depending how it's spelled, if you use it with a yud or with an aleph, that like, depends which vowel you go with. Depending on how it's spelled, that's what kind of number you're going to get from it. This version, spelling hey with a yud and spelling vav with a yud instead of with an aleph, all that adds up to 72. 10 plus 6 plus 4 plus 5 plus 10 plus 6 plus 10 plus 6. 6 plus 5 plus 10. That all adds up to 72. Why is 72 important? We're going to get to why we have the name of Avaya for a second. We found the name of Avaya, we got 72. 72, three times, is 216. What is the numerical value of Arye Lion? 216. So everything comes together. Now, we're going to get to, we're going to break down a little bit more about how we actually get there and we're bringing it all in. But the bottom line is that it's showing, you can see everything's like a massive web, interconnected web is basically what we're showing. Again, we see even the language of the hand here. These are all hands of strength. So it is showing how everything ultimately, the interconnectivity of it all. That's what we're going to get to. Till next time.